My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. Hallelujah. You may be seated. God bless you. Congratulations, Pastor and Mrs. Owina Sunday. What a change in status <laughs> in a moment. You know, there are different kinds of power in the kingdom. And the most authoritative dimension of power does not require so much strength and talking. It's an executive kind of power and it is called exousia. Exousia functions within the confines of ordinances and so when you follow the laws, the precepts and the ordinances, a word can create a change that is eternal. There was no shouting, there was no speaking in tongues. God's servant just stood and said, I declare you husband and wife. It is so forever and ever. The angels will acknowledge it. Men will acknowledge it. Systems will acknowledge it. And so, Pastor Sunday's status just changed by a decree. Congratulations. Woman of God, congratulations. This morning, I want to sincerely honor God's servant and his wife, Pastor and Pastor Mrs. Sam Ajibo. Thank you so much. It's truly an honor to be here to share God's word. A thousand and one time, my whole family will be mobilized to come. And so we, we are grateful that she made, made that time to come. Thank you so much. We had workers and pastors from EGMI travel to also come here to be part of the work. And um, it's because Pastor Sonny and his wife are significant part of what we do. Thank you so much. This morning, it's, um, it's a service, a marriage service, and so um, it's not a morning of so much revelations. Just bring us a few words of counsel and a few words of admonition to help us discern this spiritual institution from the context and the perspective of God's realm. The marriage institution is one of the most fought institutions in our time, and the devil is trying as much as possible, not just to discredit it, but to pull it down so that generations to come will not see the need for marriage. And when that is achieved, the morality of society will break down. Because the most potent instrument of God for establishing his counsel and his ordinance over a dispensation and a generation is the family institution. Even the church is secondary to the family. Because the first church that was created was created in the Garden of Eden. And that church began as a family. This is why the ordinance of marriage cannot be taken for granted. There are many nations of the world today that the soul of morality has collapsed. And the reason that is possible is because the marriage institution was successfully attacked, destroyed, and today it holds no value at all. And so it's important for us to study the subject, first of all, to redefine it from the perspective of scriptures, and secondly, to state the significance it holds in the kingdom of God and in establishing the purposes of God on the face of the earth. This is why it's important for us to share the word of God whenever we gather in a marriage service like this. Else, the moment they are joined, everything is achieved. But if it is not redefined and if it's, the, the significance is not well stated, people may just assume it's a union of two lovers, gender, irrespective, and um, anytime they want, they can back out so long as they feel it's not working. That's not how God sees it this institution. This morning, I may not have all the time to redefine what the marriage institution is, but I just want to define um, a bit this morning 
what this kind of union entails because it's a journey and as you begin today you will discover it for yourself communion and unions like this are a lifelong journey and because it's a journey you are not supposed to be carried away by the first ceremony the first ceremony is just like an inauguration it's like an induction but the actual reality begins afterwards and when you study every union where two or three persons are required to couple together and become one there are three phases of that journey and i'll talk about it briefly this morning the first phase of that journey is the force that triggered attraction and for this context we call it love after attraction is achieved then the second phase is activated which is understanding and after understanding is achieved then the third phase is achieved is activated which is trust if you don't migrate from love through understanding to trust your union cannot work many people begin a journey like this and they stop at the induction phase which is love and the moment the face of love wears out they feel the union is no longer necessary and if you travel to the west or you are acquainted with the things that happen from the western part of the world you discover that people dissolve and disannul marriages like this just because the feeling is no longer there they say i don't love him anymore and you know i don't think i can continue with this it's not working it's not working and they use all kinds of phonetics because they don't understand the weight and the depth of what the institution is about in fact some other persons marry primarily because they love the person and i have talked many times i said in the context of the kingdom nobles don't marry who they love love becomes part of it but nobles marry for kingdom so sometimes you may love a kind of person with certain features but while you are advancing in that direction god will point at another person and said when i coupled you from the studio of eternity this is who i designed for you if you want to fulfill destiny you will have to put your feeling in your pocket and follow what God is telling you. If not, the moment she gives birth to one or two children, the belly will protrude and the shape you admired will vanish. You will now discover that the one that spoke, spoke from eternity. He realized that a point will come where the shape will change. Now, this man you saw, you are seeing now who is slim with a very clean mustache. You don't know what tomorrow looks like. Maybe the moment he becomes a billionaire, the stomach will protrude and you will now... I didn't see this shape when I saw you at first. That's why when the immortals begin to couple men together, they put love as a secondary factor. You begin with a commandment. And that commandment does not only ask that both of you are coupled, that commandment also necessitates that you love who you marry. So loving becomes an instruction. It's not a product of feeling. So a point will come where you discover you don't love your wife because you have feelings for her. You will love your wife because God commands you to love her. And when you begin to study love from the articles of, of heaven, you will discover it's deeper than a feeling. And so this morning, let me begin by talking love a bit. And then I will advance to understanding. I will speak for just 30 minutes, so don't bother. I will not overemphasize. Praise God. In Amos chapter 3 verse 3, the Bible said, How can two walk together? Except they be agreed. That means this journey is a journey of agreement. An agreement, somebody said, agreement is agreement. Praise God. You know, but like I started, it's natural for you to have discerned this elegant damsel. Maybe you love her complexion. Maybe you love the way she smiles. Maybe you love the slimness. But when two children come, she will not be this slim again. So if it's slimness that brought you here, sorry sir, you made a serious blunder. But I know it's not slimness that brought you by the way. You know, so this agreement is um, premised on something that we call covenant. And the reason God uses covenant to define love in the kingdom is because, I'm talking about love now, is because when you meet someone, naturally feelings emanate. And the reason feelings emanate is because you are a psychological being. There are hormones that are, you know, rolling through your, ve your veins and your vessels now. So feelings emanate. But God also knows that feelings are not competent factors to build your destiny up. And so when God wants to become part of this, your love story, the only basis by which God will come into the equation is called covenant. The reason God does that again is because there are many assumptions in your mind. You are assuming now that this lady will be very submissive. 
you are assuming now that whatever you want to do, this lady will support you. And this lady is also assuming that maybe because you have a degree and you are humble, you are quiet, you are intelligent, you will support her to achieve her bogus ambitions. So you came up here with love and with assumptions and with feelings. But God will have to excuse your assumptions. God will have to excuse your feelings because, you know, as a scientist, assumption is the lowest level of knowledge. When we begin as scientists, you look at a reality, you make an assumption. After you make those intelligent assumptions, you carry out what we call hypothesis. You study the patterns and then you predict certain trends. When you carry out hypothesis, you now go into experimentation. You carry out actual experiment to find out how these things work. And then when you are done with experimentation, then you can propound a theory. When you propound the theory and the theory works, then it becomes a law. So assumption is actually the lowest realm of knowledge. When you came up here together, you came with assumptions. I can assure you that 70% of your smile is built on assumption. I can assure you that 70% of your smiles, maybe since you are a lady, yours may be 90%. 90% of your smiles are built on assumption. You are hoping that when we settle down, money is coming from somewhere. Because when you wear the suit, you wear. You say, this man can have 3 million. Maybe when we, uh, money can come. Money will come. Money is not a problem. You think money is not a problem. That's why you are happy. I will assure you that sometimes in three months, there will be no money. You will discover that the smile will not be consistent because the more you start working together, assumption will diffuse. And God knows that your feelings and your assumptions will diffuse. So he won't take the risk of joining this relationship on the strength of feeling and assumption. So what God decides is that you will coordinate it with a covenant. And a covenant, the Bible makes us understand in Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 17, that it is sealed with an oath. And the reason God uses an oath is because anytime you violate this covenant in the realm of God, you are no longer a factor. Because the spirit will value you based on to the, the degree to which you stand on your oath. So if tomorrow, for example, all the things you assume about her don't come out so, you have already sworn an oath. And if tomorrow all the things she assumed about you doesn't happen, you have already sworn an oath. So you will not just say, I'm walking out. God doesn't walk in and out like that. He's a spirit. Because right now, it's not two that are married. It's actually three that are married. Many times when we couple marriages, we say it's a marriage between a male and a female. It's not so. A marriage is actually a coupling between a male, a female, and a spirit. It is the spirit component that makes it a covenant. And if you study Ecclesiastes chapter 4 from verse 12, the Bible said a threefold cord cannot be easily broken. He said one man may be over overwhelmed. He said two men could fight. He said but a threefold cord. So a marriage is a threefold cord. And the only thing that can bring the integrity of God into this marriage, which is why it will work in the first place, is because there is a third cord. And that cord will not be part of it except as there is covenant. And so if you know that what is uniting you today is not a feeling, you will start this journey and begin to undermine your feeling while you prioritize God. If you know that this union today is not built on the assumptions you have made, as you go forward, your assumption will no longer define your commitment to one another. Because you will discover again and again that those assumptions will die down. And every time you see that your assumption fail, you will remember there is another spirit that is part of this union. And that spirit did not come into this union because you have assumptions. That spirit did not come into this union because you have feeling. That spirit came into this union because you saw an oath within the premise of a covenant. I'm telling you why divorce is not a casualty in a marriage. Because the order of the day in the world now is divorce. And the reason divorce is predominant in marriages is because marriages are contracted on the basis of feelings. Marriages are contracted on the basis of assumption. And so when feelings and assumptions fail, they think marriage has ended. Marriage begins after feelings and assumption. Marriage begins with covenant. Because the spirit that coupled this marriage together only respects covenant. He has no regard for your feelings. Your wife may offend you. That spirit will tell you, apologize. He doesn't care whether you like it or not. Your husband may offend you and that spirit say, apologize. He doesn't care whether you like it or not. You may discover that some of the things you thought will happen will not happen. When you lock yourself in the bedroom and you are done crying, you will come back and honor your husband because the spirit has no regard for what you feel. Your feeling is for both of you. It will add flavor to your union 
but what God sees is the oath that you took because the marriage began from covenant. So love in the kingdom is covenant. This is not a joke. We are watching movies, we are on the internet every day and we are learning marriage from Kardashians. The Kardashians don't understand what marriage is. Marriage began in Eden. It's older than man. <laughs> you are watching marriage from artists and uh, with tattoos all over their body. It, is, it doesn't begin on the beach. I know you go for honeymoon. When you come back, you come back to covenant. And when, if it's covenant that defines this union, know now that you don't have a choice. Your will was weaved into the oath that you took. And so now, the one who determines how it runs is the one that predicted the covenant. His name is Abba. I will say some strong things. That's why I'm beginning like this. And the last thing I will consider here today is your feelings. Not because it's not important. It will add flavor to your union. But your feeling is not potent enough. It doesn't have the integrity for this union to be built on it. Your feelings are too shadow. They are too unpredictable for a spirit to commit himself to it. You that wake up today, you are happy. Tomorrow you are angry. You think a spirit will come from heaven, a king spirit, and merge himself to you on the basis of your feeling. It's a joke. So thank God for the beautiful makeup. That's not what will keep the marriage working. You know, nowadays in marriage seminars, they teach women to do good makeups and wear skin things. <laughs> Ask the married. They will tell you that it's deeper than skin things. If it is based on skin things, it will work before the first pregnancy. After the first pregnancy, even the women know that the moment the stomach protrude, they will need to wear overall. Because it's not a feeling-based reality. The reason you will continue is because it's covenant. Samson is laughing because he's learned, he knows some of those things now by experience. <laughs> Praise God. Now, when you understand this foundation, then you will open your heart to understanding. If you know that this is the foundation, now that you are going forward, you will now ask yourself, if my feeling is not so important, if my assumptions are not so important, what must I do for this union to work? That is what opens the door to understanding. Because if you don't know this, you can, you know, ah, I love the rituals that God's servant did this morning. Wear your candles off. Individuality is gone forever. You will now open your mind. How do we exist together? How do we coexist? Because you will discover many things this week. I'm telling you, you will discover many things this week. A lot of things. When somebody calls you before now, he will say, you know those days I used to tell a winner, how do you hear when you are making calls? Because you can lie on the same bed with Pastor Sonia. He's talking, you won't hear what he say. And one day I asked him, I said, the person on the other side, did, is he hearing what you are saying? Those voices will change. When you need to budget for food, when you need to budget for school fees, you will not hear, I love you, how are you doing? You will say, what do you mean? How can you say you are spending 50,000? That time you say, ah, do you have this kind of baritone? It is there, it is there. <laughs> when you, when you now, see the, the hair, he's admiring. When you now come later and say, this Wivon is 50,000, he will say, no. You cannot buy Wivon for 50,000. Are you thinking well? You will now say, ah, are you insulting me because of Wivon? Madam, you can't, the, is it weak we are eating in this house? You will now discover that that same thing he admired in you might become the problem in the home. Because now you have migrated from assumption. You will tell him every week, I make my fingers for 7,000. I'm not willing to change. He will tell you, get a good razor blade. This month, we don't have money for fingers. You will say, no, I can't leave that finger. Is that not what you, you saw when you admire, approach me? Sir, I'm no longer approaching you. Now we are living together. And so, for this month, get a razor blade and brush your nails. You, you are beautiful without those fingers. He will not cause these fingers are long. That's why you are spending money. Let's leave fingers for one month. You will now say, this is my husband. He is very stingy. Well, those ones were not assumed before. Now, welcome to reality. <laughs> Elohim Adonai. When they teach marriage, they say, marry your best friend. You understand yourself, sir. <laughs> this man is an Etiloma. He came from a distant part. Their cultures, their characters, their traditions. Those things, 
be coupled into this union and he will die to them. You are from Adol. There are many things he doesn't know about you. It will be coupled, it will die, and it will take time. But the only thing that will make him stand until those differences die is because he will have respect unto the covenant. Because the God you invoked into this union this morning, he respects the covenant. And if you will go forward, you will respect the covenant. When you know this is the foundation, then you can open your mind and say, what do the wives do? That's when you will move from a lady to a wife. That's when you will move from a lady to a mother. Because many people get married, they remain ladies. They are careful of the high heat. They are careful. No lady can be married. You will become a feminist. And it will remain in your brain, thinking you are making impact. When you are 70 years old, you discover you were not wise. Most men, young men, don't marry. They believe in their strength. They look at their mirror and they see their chest. And they say their chest is bogus. They see the six pack. When they wear a suit, they stand like this. When you get married, you discover it takes a husband to be married. And so what will keep you until you become a husband and you become a wife is you have respect for the covenant. Sometimes your wife will talk to you. You just look at her. I can slap this woman now. She will faint. You will now hold yourself. And you'll be quiet for three days. You will walk in a moody way for three days. After three days, you will wake up again. You will continue. Because there's no window to jump out. But the only reason you will remain is because it didn't start on a feeling. It's not prosecuted on a feeling. It is covenant. And so when you look at her and she's no longer worth it, the covenant will always be worth it. When you look at him and it's no longer worth it, the covenant will always be worth it. And if you have no regard for the covenant, you cannot get married. That's why nobody, even society, will not recognize you as husband and wife until you live here. It is what happens here that made you a husband and wife. Covenant. When you finish covenant, then you enter understanding. And there are five things that define understanding in marriage amongst others. I list them for you quickly. Number one, is sacrifice. Sacrifice in marriage is twofold. So this understanding now is not the one you read in the book. I'm telling you experiential things. I know when you read in the book, they told you what well, a husband will sing you a love song. You would, it will take you. I know you people are already searching the location you go for honeymoon. That's textbook love. The kingdom owned is sacrifice. And sacrifice is twofold. The first fold of sacrifice is forbearance. And the second fold of sacrifice is responsibility. Let me begin with forbearance so you understand what I'm saying. Number one, Genesis 2, verse 18. When God created the man, he said, It's not good for the man to be alone. Talking about the woman now. He said, therefore, I made a suitable, I will make a suitable helper for him. So your definition within the context of responsibility is that you are a helper. So what it means is that if suddenly we wake up and discover this man used to cast out demons, now he's laboring with a demon, we will blame you. That means you are not helping him to advance the course of his destiny. If we wake up tomorrow, we discover oh, this guy used to be focused. Now he cannot be focused on anything again because there are bodies in his heart. We'll say, ah, the woman that should be a wife has become a knife because she didn't know that she was a helper. She thought she was a lover. And so if it is not about love and feeling, she's so sensitive. If the guy wakes up and you dress up and he doesn't acknowledge your dress, you say, you mean you didn't see this gown? So when he goes out now, he's troubled. It means you are not a helper. So what marriage will make you do is that you will look out for him and ignore yourself hoping that he too will look out for you and ignore himself so in responsibility the things he should have done for himself he will allow you to do it so if it's not kept it's your fault and then the same applies to him if you were an industrious woman making progress in your business all of a sudden now you get married business begins to go down we will not blame you because when you were alone you were making progress now that he has come he is the reason why the business is going down so it becomes his duty to cultivate you until you excel and become a better version of yourself. So on the part of responsibility, it is your duty to make him better. So the Bible didn't call you a lover. I know the word system will call you his lover. The love system will even call you his partner because they think marriage is sex. But in the context of the kingdom, you are not called a partner. 
you are not called a lover you are called a suitable helper and so your job is to make sure you study this man and discern his purpose you will know his purpose as much as he knows it and when you look at him you can tell everything god is doing in every season of his life there are seasons of his life where you will become an intercessor this is why marriage is not fun because he will need prayer to advance into that season and he can't pray it alone that's why god waited for you when i got married eight days later i entered the warfare my name was attacked my ministry was attacked i would have collapsed if i didn't marry maybe i wouldn't be here preaching today but god knows that there are battles ahead of him that he can't fight alone remember deuteronomy 33 verse 30 says he said one we chase a thousand he said two we put ten thousand to flight that means he has been on the face of one thousand of his life for a long time now god wants him to enter the realm of ten thousand and the only way he can enter the realm of ten thousand is to seek a helper even though i've known him for 18 years god didn't choose me you are the one god chose so you are more important to him now than i am because if he fails in destiny that's his business but now that you are here if he fails both of you are responsible because you are the suitable helper that god chose for him and so if he doesn't migrate from the realm of conquering 1,000 to 10,000, it's not his fault. It's your fault. That means the season where you should be an intercessor, you are still a hairdresser. That means the season where you should become a fasting machine, you are still a fashionista. And you think it's about gowns. You are wearing French gowns, wearing Italian gowns, whereas the man is sinking. You don't know why you came. You may still be doing your job as a partner and as a lover, but in the realm of heaven, you are failed. Because when heaven marks your score, they are seeing the degree to which you have helped this man fulfill destiny. And so in the season where fasting is required, you will fast more. In the season where prayer is required, you will pray more. In the season where moral support is required, you need to know how to enter his mind and tell him words that will bring out the masculinity in him so that he can confront destiny. The reason many men fail is because they live with lovers. They don't have helpers. And this is why most of our sisters are not prepared for marriage. When you talk about marriage, they are looking at their fingernails, looking at their complexion. They spend all their money buying cream. Who told you cream is the reason you get married? They spend all their money buying Yvonne. When they should learn, you don't know the kind of man God has sent you to marry. If you know God wants you to marry a leader, then you need to understand the ways of counsel. Because every leader succeeds by counsel. That means you must become a wise woman like the women of old. You will know what to tell the man to awaken, awaken his spirit. You will know what to tell the man to awaken his confidence until he confronts life like a winner. But in the season where you should learn wisdom, you are learning how to make your hair. You will be a lady. You will never be a wife. Because a wife is a helper. If you are not a helper, then you didn't qualify. And then when it has to do with the man in the context of responsibility, this is what the Bible said. 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 8. He said, if you cannot provide for your household, he said, you have denied the faith. You are worse than an infidel. You know, many times, when you study the subject of marriage, the punishment is always with the men. Women think that God designed marriage to disfavor, to, to make things difficult for them. The men are the victim in marriage. And as I'm talking here, you will see it. If a winner fails to provide all your needs and make you a better person, God said his Christianity is fake. His title is fake. So he can lose his, his reward in eternity because he didn't take care of you. That means this man can go to the mountain for 40 days every month, every three months and fast. This man can stir a revival, a national revival. This man can gather 50,000 people in a stadium and be raising cripples. But God says, if he cannot provide for you, he said he has denied the faith. He said he's worse than an infidel. That means his miracles, his fame, his authority, his revival. We have no reward in eternity. So if a man knows that he wants to have reward in eternity, then he must contemplate marriage carefully. People call me apostle, apostle. If I don't provide for my wife, my apostleship is an error. The people I raised, the ministry I started, the souls that I won, there will be no reward. God said, I have denied the faith. And he didn't stop there. He said, I am worse than an infidel. So your first ministry now becomes your wife. And you know how many needs she has? This woman has spiritual needs. This woman has emotional needs. This woman has financial needs. This woman has need for security. 
So our work now is to relax while you take the wheels. If she is lacking spiritually, it's your fault. That means if she couldn't hear the voice of God before now, it is no longer her duty to seek God to hear God's voice. Whatever it is you need to do to get her to the point of hearing God's voice, you must make it happen. If she couldn't fast before now, whatever you need to do to get her fasting, you must do it. If this woman cannot win souls, the only way she can begin to win souls is not her pastor, is you. Because you must take care of her spiritual needs until she qualifies to appear before God as a bride without spot. That's what he said in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. He said that thou mightest cleanse her by washing with water by the word of God. So you need to know what to do to this woman to make her become everything Jesus imagined when he created her. And then it has to do with emotional needs. You need to satisfy her emotional needs until every iota of it is met. And then you also have to satisfy her physical needs. If this woman goes hungry, it's your fault. Every day she cries, it's your fault. This woman sitting here now, if anything happens to her health, you are, it's your responsibility. If anything happens to her physical security and threatens her existence, it's your security. So marriage is not fun. It's responsibility. People are not taught the weight of the subject. And so they double into it. Who told you you are supposed to marry because you love somebody? Who is talking about feeling? Do you have what it takes to provide for the needs? Have you even taken time to understand her needs? You don't even know what she needs yet. And you say you can marry. You are not ready. Responsibility is the first requirement to sacrifice. And the second requirement is forbearance. Forbearance because most of the things you want to do for her, she may not even be ready to receive it. Many times when you correct her, she will turn back at you and begin to nag. And you know that she doesn't know as she ought to. You want to upgrade her life and she's fighting. You will have to forbear that nagging and pray until the day God opens her eyes. The reason many people jump into divorce is because they don't know that forbearance is part of sacrifice. There is no point you will get to and you will say, I can't take it anymore. That means you will forbear until you get her to that point where she's able to learn what you want to give her. And she too will forbear with you until you get to that point. The reason is because all of you are work in progress. At the end of the day, when marriage ends, it's not children God counts. It's the nature of Christ in you that God will check. Because if you have done your work, she will become more like Christ. If she has done her work, you will become more like Christ. And for that to happen, there must be responsibility and there must be forbearance. This is what we call sacrifice in marriage. And this is what many cannot do. This is why you find one man, in 10 years he has married two wives. He started with this one. He couldn't manage her. He ran away because he's still self-centered. He thinks he's marrying a woman to give him social status. He thinks he's marrying a woman to satisfy libido. A woman marries today and after two weeks, after two years, she runs out. Because she thinks she's getting married for her selfishness, self-aggrandizement and self-preservation. No, marriage is a selfless enterprise. You will leave it for the next person. And the next person will leave it for you. At the end of the day, the best dimension of both of you will emerge. And if that doesn't happen, this is not a marriage. This is a partnership of two lovers who want to satisfy their appetites and their ambition. But it will not be your case. Sacrifice is the first understanding that men must have in marriage. And I can assure you, some people have been married for 30 years. They don't know sacrifice. That's why you find men complaining about their wives to everybody. You don't have the right to complain. That thing you notice is your, is your assignment. That's why you are the cultivator of this woman. You find women complaining about their husbands to everybody. Complain is not part of the equation. I know there are places where people are unreasonable and insensitive that you need to bring authorities to look into the matter. But jumping about and complaining over every flimsy thing is actually a sign that you are irresponsible in your marriage. Because if your wife has not attained a mark, it's a call to intercession. It's a call to priesthood. It's a call to teaching and training. And if your husband has not attained to a level that God wants him to attain to. It's a call to priesthood. It's a call to service until you refine him and bring the best out of him. People don't know sacrifice in marriage. This is why marriages fail. They complain to everybody and they run out of it. 
you will not run out of this marriage. You will make it work by the help of the Holy Spirit. Number two thing you need to understand in marriage is honor. You'll be shocked. When you come to where they teach people the true ordinance of marriage, you will not hear most of the things you hear in relationship seminars. Those ones where they read it from secular books, they are not kingdom oriented. And that's why the more they teach it, the more you have divorce. That's what the West tilted into. And when they tilted into it, after a while, divorce became the order of the day. And today, seven out of every ten marriage in the West collapse. You meet them, they say they are single mothers. Every day they are in court trying to bail out of marriage because they were not taught truth. Everybody enters for his gain. And you don't know the day you entered marriage, you entered for the next person, not you. If it's about you, you would have remained alone. It would have been better. When he spoke to the woman, he said it's not good for the man to be alone. That means the woman entered the marriage because of the man. And when he spoke to the man, he said if he cannot take care of the woman, he has denied himself. That means the man entered the marriage because of the woman. You are not here for yourself. So you look out for the other person to become the best version of themselves. That's what sacrifice entails. And it will require forbearance and responsibility to get there. Number two is honor. As touching the wife in the subject of honor, the Bible calls honor, subjection, and obedience. It's a risk to get married. I'm telling you, many don't know. It's a risk. If you know what marriage is, you will sit down and pray before you get married. It's a risk. It calls honor from the part of the woman, subjection and obedience. You know what that means? That's actually the place of a slave. And I will tell you why God said that. The woman literally strips herself of everything that defines her. Any honor a woman finds in marriage is the one the man gives her. It's called subjection. You know what subjection is? That means even against your will, you will do it. Let me read Bible so that you don't think I'm talking. First Peter chapter 3 from verse 1 to 6. It says, likewise, wives, not ladies. I know there are many ladies who cannot subject themselves and who cannot be obedient to anybody. In fact, the reason the Bible said the man should leave his father is because the woman never leaves her father. The same submission you show to your father, that's what you show to your husband. So the day you get married, the man is not just your husband. The man becomes your father. That's why your father handed you over to him. Your father is not your husband. Your father is, he has rule over you. So the same rule that your father has over you, that's what your husband has over you. So if you are not sure this is the man God has ordained for you, don't enter it. And I will show you. That's why I told you the last phase in this journey is trust. Because if you can't trust him as much as you trust your father, then you can't dare enter that marriage. Because your position as touching honor is submission, subjection, and obedience. It's not a joke. Likewise, wives, he said, be in subjection to your husband. If I had time, I would have done a study of this word. He said that if any obey not the word, that's the word of God. You know what he's saying? The same way you obey the word of God, that's how you obey your husband. Be in subjection to your husband that if you do not obey the word, they also should be without the word so that those who do not, sorry, that those who do not obey the word of God, when they see your subjection, the same way you obey the word, which is transferred to your husband, it will become a model for them. So that those who don't believe in the word of God before, when they read your life, your life will become like the word of God. Your life becomes a message. So because of your modesty, those people will begin to submit to the word of God. That means your submission to your husband is like your submission to the world. So much so that when people see your submission, it will provoke them to become submissive to the word of God. That means a Muslim can be converted to Christianity because of how you subject to your husband. When he sees you, he will ask you, why do you honor this man like this? 
you will say the word of God commands me to honor him. And so because of that level of honor, the Muslim will be inspired to become submissive to the word of God. That's what marriage is. That means your, the position of a wife is a message to a generation. People don't know what marriage is. And he went further. He said, why they behold your chest conversation coupled with fear? Reverence. Why the people see your submissiveness coupled with reverence? And he, con he compared this reverence and submission to the gold you wear, the necklace you wear. He said, what beautifies you is not your necklace. He said, what beautifies you is not the diamond. He said, what beautifies you is not your hairdo. He said, the adorning of the woman when she gets married is no longer the gold and the diamond. He said, the adorning of the woman becomes the countenance of meekness expressed through submission. And he finally summarized it. He said, for after this manner, in old time, holy women also trusted in God. Oh, oh, oh. This thing should be seminars. Submission to your husband, he called it trusting in God. This is why Paul was bold in saying that if your husband is not a believer, he said your submission will win him to Christ. Because your submission to your husband now becomes like an act of worship. He said, holy women. He didn't say women of old. Holy women, meaning those who are consecrated to God. He said, this is their way of life. So you want to find a woman who is consecrated to God, you find in her submission. And that's why he called us the bride of Christ. So the same way the church cannot challenge the authority of Jesus, that's how a wife can challenge the authority of the husband. Because if you want to understand marriage in its organic sense, he says, check the relationship between Christ and the church. So whatever the church cannot do to Jesus, you can't do to your husband. It has to be an act of worship. And he called it trusting in the Lord. And he said that was the order of the women of old. And he didn't stop there. He said, even Sarah, your mother, he said she submitted to Abraham until she called Abraham Lord. Who do you call Lord? Is it not Jesus Christ? He said, Sarah, in her submission to Abraham, called Abraham, my Lord. Can you teach it now? That's why we don't have marriages. My Lord. My Lord. <laughs> we, we need wives in the church. We have too many ladies. They are trained by Kardashians. So when you look at them, it's only fingernails. Colors of fingernails and hairs, you see. You can't find wives. That's why I say to search for them. You need to search. Because the world have raised yeah, a species of Jezebels. Women of wardom that have no regard for the ordinances Me of no the kingdom. No and they mad. think they are skimpy wears. We attract honorable men, not nobles. We marry for kingdom. They are not wives. I say no man, no man. Because they are not taught Hello, the truth of the kingdom. Meanwhile, when you go into other religion, they know these things and they preserve it with their lives. Wherever your bomb might begin, will move. If you want to challenge what I'm teaching, take your Bible, read it for yourself, we'll go and, and challenge Thursday. the word of God. I'm not a preacher that looks for people's favor. I say truth the way it is. I'm a corrosive person. <laughs> so I'm sorry if I'm hurting you. Bear it in good faith. But if we must recover the soul of this generation, this truth must be preached. The stand of the tell you, your husband is your finish. friend. Hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which friend? Is that what the Bible called it? Your husband is your Lord. If it's it's Christian marriage, do reception. For, your husband is your Lord. Nobody and your example is Sarah. Go and read First Peter chapter 1 from verse, yeah. chapter 3 from verse Daddy 1 to 7. Everybody. Don't argue with me. Argue with the Bible. A granite. Then he came finish. to the man. I told you, when we teach marriage, it looks as if the women are disadvantaged. <laughs> it's a joke. He said, concerning the man, likewise, ye husband, dwell with them according to knowledge. 
You know what that knowledge is? That knowledge is death. The same way Christ loved the church and died for the church. That means when the woman is submitting to that man, that kind of man, she's not taking a risk. The same way the church submitting to Christ is not a risk. Because this Christ you submit to is not somebody who wants to take advantage of you. He's somebody who wants to die for you. When you find boys, they, they collect money from women. That's what boys do. When you find a boy, if he gets into a relationship with a woman, she's looking for how like he, he's looking for how to take advantage of the woman. Suddenly, all the woman's money, he begins to control it. He starts spending it. He can even take the woman's property. That's what boys do. They are not men. Men don't take, they give. Well, I like, but no one gets sense when like. That's men. Those are husbands. And if you submit to that kind of person, even the life you gave him, he will add it to his own and give it to God. Husbands don't take advantage of women. Husbands die for women. Since when you find a husband, that boy, since his greatest since honor that boy. is when he takes your shame. Saying, Dash his greatest honor is, give is when he dies for you. He's he not there to take advantage of you. He's there to cultivate you until the best of you come out. When you find a self-centered person, self-oriented I, person, I, I, I he's looking for every day, opportunity to take advantage. Did they wear divine go marry, come off for their house? As a boy, now that day go no say him be man. You can ask my wife. I didn't take one naira from her until we got married. Not a dime. I don't need her money. Not a dime. That's that. Those are men. Now there's a place when you get married, you have understanding on how to collectively build the family together. But when it comes to taking advantage for yourself, you are not a man. And you will see what God will do to such people. He said, relate with them with knowledge. And number two, he said, giving honor unto your wife. You see why I told you, the honor of the woman, the man gives it. That means everything the man is, the woman becomes his crown. So when you see a woman, she doesn't need to fight for honor. No, everything the husband is, he gives it to her. A man who doesn't know how to honor his wife. He's not a husband. They are still married. He's still fighting. I'm the head of the union. That's a boy. I'm the boss here. That's a boy. When you find a man, he serves the woman into glory. And this is why the woman we have too much assurance to submit everything to that kind of man. Because she knows she's not taking a risk. That man becomes her greatest insurance system after God. But not our African men. Our African men are tyrants. They are looking for weak women to exploit and to take advantage of. Financially, spiritually, and physically. When the woman comes, they beat her. When the woman has money, they take it. And when the woman wants to say anything, they use spirit, spiritism to manipulate her. Because they don't have what it takes to lead. So they carry one scripture, squeeze that scripture, and oppress the woman, knowing fully where that if you bring this in the spectrum of light, it's not truth. I'm the head of the union. I'm the head of the home. I'm this, this. It's boys that fight for it. Men don't fight to take authority. They don't fight for leadership. The woman gives it to them because she knows. She knows. This is why marriage is suffering. There's no honor. There's no honor. The man wants to take advantage of the woman's vulnerability. And because the woman sees that the man wants to take advantage, she becomes quickly independent. She begins to create system to guarantee her independence because she can't trust this man. The last time she trusted him, he exploited her. Because that's a tyrant and a criminal, a wolf in sheep clothing. And this is what Peter told us. He said, you need to know that it's only marriage that God gave you the honor of being the head. He said, you also need to understand that even though both of you are in marriage, both of you are equal heirs of the grace of God. She is not your slave. She assumed the disposition of a slave, but both of you are heirs of the kingdom. The same way you are a co-heir with Christ, that's how she's a co-heir with Christ. So even though in this union, God told her to function in submission. Remember, 
when you deal with her that you are dealing with a co-heir with Christ. If you forget that she's a co-heir with Christ, he said, what God will do is that your prayers will not be answered. That means a man who doesn't know how to take care of a woman, his relationship with God is at risk. Because when he talked about prayer, he's not just talking about Father who is in heaven, hello be thy name. He's actually talking about your relationship with God. That means if you destroy and marginalize your wife, what you will pay as a price is your own relationship with God. God will cut you off of him. And so if you value your relationship with God, you will make sure that woman is not taken advantage of in that relationship. Everything she gives you, you preserve it with your life. And if you need to die to keep it, you will die. By all means, that woman should be honored because she's connected to you. Her vulnerability to you is a testimony of loyalty and submission. But your return of honor to her is also your own testimony of love and loyalty. If these two cannot exist, then you have not come into understanding. You don't know what marriage is about. I don't have time. I don't have time. Our generation needs to be taught marriage. You want to be husband? Go and find out how Jesus relates with the church. If you cannot operate with your wife the way Jesus operated with the church, you are not a husband. You have a title, but you are not a husband. The priority of Jesus is to refine the church until the church becomes everything. He said when he returns, we will be like a bride without spot or without wrinkle. And for that to happen, Jesus stripped himself of the garment of divinity. The honor that he had with God, he took it off. That means any time you want to truly be husband, the argument will not be I'm the head of the home. No. You are willing to give up everything. So a man actually doesn't have a title in that union. If he needs to become a servant for the union to work, he will become a servant. If he needs to become a teacher for the union to work, he will become a teacher. Anything he needs to become for that union to work, he's willing to pay that price. That's a husband. We have manipulators everywhere. A lady was sharing with me three men that she entered relationship with only came to exploit her. And she said, all these young Christians shouting fire, fire in church, she will not date them again. The last time she tried somebody who is not a, a church goer, she had it better. What a shame. A brother putting 90 scriptures, praying in tongues like thunder. But the sisters are scared of them because they now see them as wolves in sheep clothing. Self-centered, self-oriented, insecure and egoistic people. It's now a risk to date a believer who is on fire. They will rather date a young guy who is just walking on the street. It's a pity. That means the Christ-likeness is not there. We may be genuinely anointed, but the Christ-likeness is not there. The third thing under understanding is humility. That is a teachable spirit. The fourth thing under understanding is a sense of humor. I know you sleep in heaven, but when you come home, laugh. Crack jokes for your wife. Play with her. Don't come and be walking like this. Even if angels are walking with you, your wife also is an angel. Some men are so boring. Boring in the name of being believers. The woman wears a gown. They stand up and say, you get one What kind of gown is this? Post that you know you guys. Oh God. Oh God. So long as it's modest you and it's not sedu post yes, seductive. You get one status where you am post yesterday. The woman wears a wig. She and said, status, this, these wigs are pastor. taken from the ocean. She puts a nail. The man said, all these nails are Jezebelic. <laughs> Hope you know I mentioned these things before. It's the extremism that we have addressed. Modesty is allowed. Are we together? 
So your wife should not become a shadow of herself. She don't come out. When you come home, laugh with her, crack jokes. Let her break her ribs. I, I'm, a, I'm a clown. If you know me closely, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Sometimes my wife, literally, she will be blushing. <laughs> she leaves, she will be. Sometimes when I do something, she'll say, This one is politics. We couple everything together to make her laugh. And the same applies to the woman. Your husband is stressed. The stress is much. It's much. Spiritual stress, mental stress, financial stress. When he comes home, please let him relax. You must have a sense of humor. It's part of understanding. And then finally, the oil must flow. Nothing works without the oil. If it's this kingdom, nothing works without the oil. A house that is devoid of the anointing will crack. The anointing is the buffer of the union. In Psalm 133 from verse 1 to 3, it says, Behold, how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. It says, like the oil flowing from the head of Aaron down to his beard, onto his cat. It said, it's like the dew upon Mount Hermon. He said, there the Lord commands his blessing. That means the impute of God enters the union when the oil begins to flow. When the oil is not there, all of these four things will still not work. The oil is what makes the difference. Because demons will come to attack. You may be willing to sacrifice, but while you are sacrificing, a demon will come and amplify her fault. While she is sacrificing, a demon will come and whisper into her ear. If that one doesn't work, a demon can attack your finances. Because he knows in the face of poverty, there will be crisis. Sometimes, if he can attack finances, he will attack your health. Attack her health. Attack the children's health. A man must rise and provoke the oil. Let it flow. So that it becomes the defender of the union. When the devil comes, there is an utterance that forbids the finger of darkness. That's why I say making no place for the devil. So if oil cannot be produced in this union, the union will crack. When you see a vehicle moving, it's a product of oil. They call them lubricants. The reason iron can dwell with rubber is lubricant. When the oil begins to flow, it no longer matters if you are a Tulu and she's adult from Idoma. That, that difference will be lubricated. The same way you have gear oil, you have engine oil, all kinds of oil to cause different parts to exist in harmony. When you see a Ferrari car, it moves in the speed of light. The reason it's moving is because oil is at work. There's an oil that produces energy. That's the gasoline. There's an oil that produces harmony. When this oil begins to flow, the anointing will buffer the stress. It will buffer the mistakes. It will buffer the error. Until a point come, two of you will exist with the same mystery that govern the Trinity. And that's why when you find a marriage that works, over time, the husband begins to look like the wife. And the wife begins to look like the husband. The impact will literally affect their physical structure because oil is flowing. If that oil doesn't flow, a demon can sit in your brain. A demon can sit in her brain. You will blame her for 10 years after you divorce. Two weeks later, you will look at her and you will now start admiring her. You will say, what is happening? What you were seeing was a demon. But there was no oil to fight. The oil comes to bring defense. The oil comes to bring lubrication so that your differences can be swallowed up. And what will come out will be an expression of the Christos. When we see you, your home will become a realm of encounter. When people want to see God, they want to go to your home. And even people that have crisis, when they enter the atmosphere of your home, it becomes a, a healer to their soul. It becomes a healer. A husband and wife can be quarreling. They enter your home. When you are done with them, they will go out. Peace has entered. Because an oil is flowing. You may not even talk to them about their crisis. The oil is working. Because the oil has utterance. That's why he said, you have no need for any man to teach you. He said, you have an unction from the Holy Ghost. It's the oil. That unction is a teacher. That unction is a healer. That unction is a defender. For a marriage to work, there must be an anointing. That's why priesthood must become the foundation upon, this, upon which this home is built. And I'm not in doubt. Because I know these things will find expression. When you pass the test of understanding, you come to the point where 
you arrive at the destination of the journey. The destination of the journey is trust. When you go, get into trust, you find rest. You won't need to check or probe anything anymore. All things begin to work together for good. All things begin to work together for good because you now see your partner as yourself. That's what trust means. Trust does not necessarily mean that you now understand everything about your partner. No, you may never do that for eternity. Trust means you come to a point where you can no longer see your partner apart from yourself. When you see your wife, you see yourself. When your wife sees you, she sees herself. So everything she thinks about herself is what she thinks with you. Your wife can see you counseling a lady. She will not be moved. You can drop, you don't, she knows all the password, your phone, your account, everything. She's not trying to take your money for herself. Your money is her own. She has come to that level. Anything she sees you doing, she sees herself doing it. And anything you see her doing, you see yourself doing it. When you get there, you find rest. If a marriage can reach that level, even if the whole of Hades and all the demons in the world are mobilized, they will not break it. Don't be an anointed man with a failed home. It takes more than anointing to build a home. And don't be an anointed woman without a home. It takes much more. You need to understand that the purposes of God that both of you will bring expression to in your own time will be built on the effectiveness and the efficacy of your home. And for that to happen, you must travel the way of love, of understanding, and of trust. Bow your heads. Let's pray. Please tell the Lord to help you. There are many homes here today that are at the verge of collapse. It looks like we are talking to those who are getting married. They are not the only people we are talking to. There are many selfish and self-centered men here today. There are many arrogant and unsubjective or submissive women here today. You tell everybody the problem of your family is your husband. It's not true. When the wise men come and x-ray the home, from your report, from the way you present the case, they will know you are the problem of the home. You may need to ask the Lord to help you. And there are many young men and young women here that are yet to get married. Sir and ma, please put that phone aside. That's kindergarten. Marriage is about covenant. Marriage is about understanding. And marriage is about trust. The emotion is only a flavor. But the flavor is not the foundation. Ask the Lord to help you. I will pray for families here this morning that are already going through crisis. That the wisdom of God that surpasses knowledge will garrison your heart. And I will pray for marriages to also be conscripted from here. Because there are many of you who are still trusting God for settlement. You came to celebrate them, but not too long from now, you too will be celebrated. So river flow, river flow. Let it an river flow in your church once again. Let eternity be seen. River flow, river flow. Let it an river flow in your church once again. Let it on it be seen. River flow, river flow. Let it on river flow. In your church once again. Let it on it be seen. Do you know one of the reasons Jesus went to heaven? Apart from the fact that the Holy Ghost needed to come, is because Jesus knows that when the Holy Ghost comes, many Jesuses will be born. The goal is for you to become the reflection of the God that you represent. And marriage is one of the institutions that will chisel that out of you. You can be fake to the whole world, not to your wife and not to your husband. Please ask the Lord to help you. It's not just about renovating families. It's actually about renovating your soul structure. Because most times, more than 50% of the problems we have is because of who we are, not because of where we are, or not because of who we are with. If who you are is worked upon, your context will be affected. Ask God for help. 
Let it all it is. River flow, river flow. Let it all oh, river flow in your church once again. Let it all it is. Thank you, Father. Precious Father, we pray for this couple again. We ask that these words spoken this morning, we go, don't worry, sit down. We go into the foundation of their union and it will become an eternal rock that will not be broken. Father, we ask that you will help them. This one will not fail. Rather, it will become an example to many in the name of the Lord Jesus. We pray for homes and families here this morning that are going through struggles of all sorts. Spiritual struggles, emotional struggles, financial struggles, demonic challenges with decree that from this service let there be an intervention. In the name of Jesus, we put an end to the siege. And Father, we pray for many young people here this morning trusting you for settlement. We ask that you walk upon them, make them become husbands and wives, and also cause that their feet will cross, their paths will cross, and let those unions be achieved. Before the end of this year, Father, give us a sign by causing many to get settled, and let your name be glorified. Thank you, Abba Father. In Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Now, now, we have addressed homes. We need to address lives. Some of us here have crisis. We have issues, demonic issues. Some of us have not even given our, received the life of God into our spirit. We are still rude and manipulated by the things happening in our environment. In the next one minute, if you want to make a commitment to Jesus and tell the Lord, Father, help me. I don't look like you. I've not even received your life. Help me this morning. I know I've done many things in the past. Start a new walk with me. Just in case you want to make that prayer, put your hand on your chest. Let me lead you to pray now. Every one of us here this morning who are standing by the grace of God, we are standing because we are helped. Nobody is standing because he's skilled, wise, or special. Everybody standing is standing because he or she is helped of God. Do we have people placing their hands on their chest? Can you wave so that I know? And let's not pray into thin air. You are placing your hand on your chest. Look at that. So many people making commitment to Jesus. Making commitment. Making commitment. Those of you waving your hands, stand up. Don't worry, you are not coming out. But even if you have to come out, don't be ashamed. Because if you are ashamed of God before men, he will be ashamed of you before his father and the angels. Those of you who are not making commitment, sit down so that we know who we are talking to. But those who are making commitment, boldly stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Quickly. Quickly stand to your feet. Pastor King, I think you should be taking statistics now. Stand to your feet. Place your hands on your chest and pray this prayer with me and mean it from the depth of your heart and see how God will help you. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning. I ask for forgiveness for every part of error in my life. I receive eternal life into my spirit. I ask that you receive me into your family. Thank you, Father, because according to your word, I believe in my heart that Jesus is your son. That he died for my sins and that he rose again from the dead for my justification. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord of my life. Thank you, Father, for receiving me this morning. In Jesus' name I have prayed. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray for these ones making this commitment this morning. I ask that your hand will rest upon them from today. Preserve them, keep them, strengthen them. 
I decree if there's any chain of the devil over their lives, it's, it's broken this morning. And as they walk out of this place, they walk out as new creatures, enjoying the fullness of your blessings and living to glorify your name. So let it be written and so let it be established in Jesus' precious name we have prayed. Amen. God bless you. Once again, put your hands together for Jesus. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ, ask the Lord and personal Savior. I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.